and an absolutely exceptional speaker. Srini has been here with us in previous events as well, but it's been a lot of years, so we're super happy to have him back. Tonight's speaker is an inventor with over 35, not over, with 35 patents in database and distributed systems technology. He has over 20 years experience designing high-scale, real-time infrastructures, data infrastructures. He was previously on the team at IBM that created DB2. No kidding, guys. Please welcome the founder and CTO of Aerospike, Srini Srinivasan. Thank you, Eric. It's a pleasure to be here today. I almost didn't make it because my flight to Newark from San Francisco got diverted you know, yesterday to Chicago and then they canceled it at 11 p.m. So it's, it's a mini miracle that I'm here. All the technology that everybody's invented actually helped me get here today. So I, I definitely thank the iPhone, Microsoft, everybody in the world who invented technology. It worked. Um, so today, I'm going to talk to you about uh, how to get unlimited scale for real time, you know, for applications that, that require real time SLAs. Uh, and these are not just simple apps, but these are rich set of uh, data oriented applications. And to some extent, this talk is created out of my experiences and the company's experiences and, you know, and our customers' experiences over the last 12 years. When we started Aerospike in 2009, as one of the trivia questions, you know, we've been working on solving this problem because most of the time when I worked at, uh, I think at that time I was working at Yahoo, it's nothing against Yahoo or the databases I used then because I was using relational databases and so on to build um, really high scale application which required SLAs. And, I, and we were failing basically to do that. And you can see that with the invention of a number of new database applications over the last decade or so, right? I mean, there's so many of them which have been invented. Um, but then, uh, when we started Aerospike, we were actually, you know, uh, trying to figure out how to solve this so you can start with the platform and then reach this level of SLA and continue to scale and then still be able to keep the same platform going, right? Usually people replace platforms as they scale, um, which is the norm. And that is the experience I want to talk to you about. We started to do that 12 years ago, and to some extent, all of the things I talk about today are, are based on all the events that have happened over the last 12 years. So it gives you a really good idea of um, what you might be thinking about if you're starting on new projects or even if you have large projects today uh, which require these kinds of SLAs. So the agenda of this is actually uh, twofold. The first one is what do you need to do, what do you need to think about for building with unlimited scale, for unlimited scale? These are for typically architects, data architects, system engineers who are trying to build these systems, okay? And there's a whole bunch of, what, what do I mean by the kind of problems you're trying to solve? You know, there's a high throughput, low latency transactions, you know, using DRAM, SSD and more. You'll see some of this whole hardware oriented thing. I'm a software guy, basically, you know, that's what I've done in my, in my entire career. But with Aerospike, we started really utilizing some of the storage technologies, the cutting edge technologies invented by the large storage companies like Micron, Intel, and so on, and try to leverage it to solve the problem we're talking about, you know, real-time SLAs at scale. And geodistribution is important. We're a database and so on, you know, a day, for a database, uh, distributing data globally, right? I mean, every uh, thing that we do on the internet is global, right? I mean, you, you have the iPhone, which is kind of, a, or, or for the matter, an Android uh, phone, which I carried for eight years. I almost carried the you know, both of them for about uh, the same amount of time in my life. And, and the important thing there is you, you actually leverage a lot of global services and so on, and these things have to work for you. When a packet is shipped on FedEx or UPS, you know, you want to globally know and in one place where it exactly is at any point in time. That's just one example. There's so many examples like that. So distribution, geodistribution, active, active, making sure it works is good. Um, streaming is important as things are coming in. Can you make some inferences as to what's going on in your network without having to look at all the data that exists in your database is also an interesting problem. And then uh, things like parallelism and secondary indexes. These are architectural things. I'm also going to shake you through you know, uh, some application examples for developers as to what can you do with this technology, right? I mean, it's easy to talk about technology, how it works, and what problems it solves. But how can a developer actually try to use it? 
You know, what are the hooks? And frankly, it has to come at the language and at the system that the developers are already used to using, right? That's kind of the premise of this. And how to get this technology to everybody. Um, and so, you know, we'll talk about document, and I'll show you some things about document stuff, and you can go try it out later. You know, SQL-based um, access with Presto, all to a platform which does all these things, you know, including time series and graphs. And the graphs are not quite there, but I'll talk about that. And then I'd be happy to take questions and discuss you know, um, uh, on, on this area as, as, as deeply or as shallowly as you want, you know. It's, 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 uh, it's fine. So what exactly is unlimited scale? Okay, unlimited scale is not a number to me. It is more, you know, essentially because real-time SLAs, uh, real-time apps have strict SLAs, and you want to have the same experience in these apps as you scale up, right? When you, when you start, you know, uh, when Google started, for example, um, their search was 20% better in terms of performance and also better in quality than every other search that existed. Search was supposed to be a closed thing when Google started out, okay? But Google immediately captured the market because if you can provide the experience to every user, every person on the planet who comes to do a search, and it's better all the time than everybody else, and it, no, one, no one is staying static, you're always staying ahead. And then you basically dominate, right? And this is, this is, this is played out you know, in a lot of companies, okay? I mean, same thing happened with Facebook, and you can just pick your uh, various, um, you know, favorite example there. The other thing is, you need to deal with spikes, you know? Uh, I remember, this is a really old example, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm showing my age, I guess. You know, uh, I think the only website that actually stood up on the day the news of um, Michael Jackson, he passed away at some point, that news was announced, the only website that stood was actually Yahoo's content set. You know why? Because it was always running at 40%. Said by one of the founders of Yahoo, you know, Philo basically said, you know, you can't do more than 40%. That little handle, so there needs to be headroom, okay? And all of this pro provides a level of scale. What does it mean? You have a business which is growing, right? You want to make sure that the platform can scale at the rate of business growth, that it doesn't slow it down. To me, that's really unlimited scale. Can your business grow unimpeded based on you know, whatever is happening in the business without your platform getting in the way? And there are lots of examples, which I won't share today because that is a little bit more salesy. I'm just gonna talk about the basic facts, right? There are actual things that have happened over the last 12 years. We can talk elsewhere, you know, over a beer or something. But the point is, there are really important consequential decisions that are made in technology for scaling, which impact business scaling. And that's what unlimited scale, in the, for the context of what I'm talking about, it means can I scale your business and the technology is not going to be in the way. Which means it's continuing to scale 10x, and I'm not talking about 2x, 10x, 100x, 1000x is where businesses have gone. And I've observed them over the last 12 years as an observer of our, what our customers are doing. And, and this is something, and, and we talked about AppNexus, right? We were there in AppNexus in 2010 when Mike Nolet and Brian O'Kelly, they founded it. One of the early technology uh, um, uh, choices that they made was to use Aerospike. I'm uh, sorry, it was called Citrus Leaf, sorry. <laughs> Apologies. Because um, they still call it Citrus, I think. Um, and then the other important thing about unlimited scale can Google scale in an unlimited way? Anybody? The answer is yes or no? Pardon? Can Google scale? Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's, a, it's a strong yes. Yeah. But they also have unlimited funds. Mm. <laughs> so of course they can scale unlimited, even if they use not the best technology. I'm not saying they're not, but but the point is, they can. But if you are setting up a company like the Trade Desk in 2011, this is a valid example. 2011 Trade Desk, small company. AppNexus, small company. AdTech. Okay. They're trying to take on. Who are they taking on? Google, which is also entering display advertising. They acquired somebody which, act, but they actually beat Google. Google has all the resources in the world, right? How did they beat it? Trade Desk used, you know, the, the kind of technology I'm talking about. AppNex has used it, which means they could achieve the scale of Google without spending the money Google was spending on it. That's really important for startups to grow. If you can't do that, forget about it. You're not going to be able to scale. You've got to do it differently. And of course, the good news is we have the ability to do that if we look at the latest in technology and adapt it. And I'm a software person, so you know, there's this whole article by uh, Mark Andreessen about software eating the world. And that's what software is. Software isn't doing anything smarter than what the hardware is using it on. It's just being smart about how to use the hardware and, and the latest innovations. You can also wait 
for Moore's law to take over and not change your software, every couple of years it will go double in size. But if you want to get a 10x, 100x boost, you have to understand the hardware characteristics and adapt them to writing your software, which is kind of the whole point of this talk. Okay? What is the example of a real time SLA? This is an ad tech thing, which is, you know, we talk about ad tech. This is just one example. You want low read write latency on a single read. It is not for a transaction, don't get it wrong. You might read, you might read and write 100 uh, items in a transaction. It may take 10 to 20 milliseconds, or maybe, maybe even 200 milliseconds. What happens at the end of that transaction is you might actually assign a fraud score, like maybe somebody, somebody like PayPal would do, for a transaction in process. The, if the transaction takes about 250 to 300 milliseconds to complete, your fraud score better arrive before the transaction completes. Otherwise, there is risk, right? And you can't do a fraud score with just looking at five things. Because the fraudsters are continuing to look at more data and, and create new fraud. So you've got to look at thousands of items. So these are problems you have to do. So that's the low, the low read write latency at the database level will result in your ability to look at a lot more data in a short amount of time to make a better decision, right? And then we're talking about huge number of operations a second. If you're doing like a you know a thousand operations a second or ten thousand operations a second, it's not a hard problem. You can do it with all. I mean, I've written you know I worked in DB2 and stuff. Those things can handle quite you know fine there. But at some point they break down. Why do they break down? Because you end up having to actually take a write and then look at the data again. They can't handle both at the same time. This is why you have you know Cassandra was invented, you know Redis does certain things, and you know, invented, you know various things come. Why? Because you're trying to solve a problem that is not solved before that, and there's lots of transactions today. Availability is even more important. It's one thing to do the transaction. If you don't do the transactions, you're not in business. If you if you basically are not uptime. In fact, Facebook exists because they were mo had better uptime than MySpace. Okay, that's the single most important reason. Everything else, I think, is, is you know, because the other one, like if you're not up all the time and you want to talk to your friends, I mean, you're done. You're not going to go through that platform again, right? Uptime is really important. You can't miss the SLA in your uptime either. Being up doesn't mean, oh, I'm up, but it takes five seconds to get it, okay? That is not being up. Being up means you're being up with an SLA, which makes you able to use it with a level of user experience which cannot be compromised, right? And then it has to be global, of course. It's, it's pretty common, right? So that's kind of it. The, the short introduction. So, I'm going to talk first about the first of those things, high throughput, low latency transactions in DRAM, SSD, and more. What does this really mean? If what I'm saying is, there's a bunch of storage and other hardware optimizations that have happened over the years. How do we leverage those in order to produce these kinds of transactions? Okay, That's all this is all about. And this is to give you an idea of how to think different, right? This is a classic database, you know, I've, I've worked on this, you know, when I was much younger. And the point is, it's a fine architecture. It is trying to solve the problem where this thing is slow, and this thing is long, you know, and essentially everything is slow, but it is trying to worry about the block interface is just to make uh, caching work. You just grab a bunch of data, put it in memory, access it in memory, okay? And then you keep on, and this will only work if you don't have to access any data at any point in time. So long as you can do have a working set of data you're working with repeatedly, this is a fine architecture. This is how Oracle works, DB2. In fact, all the modern databases, even NoSQL people, I mean, everybody works that way. But this is a different architecture. You know, when we looked at SSDs in 2009, the reason why you know Applex is picked us in 2010 is because of this. What does it do? It gets rid of all the code first of all, and it just looks at the, how SSDs work. We can directly read from SSD. That's fundamentally all it is. It is, you just can read directly from it, okay? It is parallel. You can go read a block of thing. It's, it's, it's not like rotational. Disk. You don't have to wait until the, you know, uh, everything arrives under the head and all that. You just go read it. It's highly parallelized. But you have to change the write model because if you write under the same, you know, um, cell on an SSD, it'll wear it out. So your SSD is all going to just die. So you have, we, we changed it, right? So, so you end up doing large block writes on SSDs. And then, the vendors optimized it. SSD vendors kept optimizing it over time, right? We started with this model, and then we, we then had to write software to do continuous defragmentation. What does continuous defragmentation mean? It means that the system, this is the continuous uptime thing, so you have headroom. So you're always handling transactions, you're basically dealing with defragmentation, you're doing all of it all the time. 
So, and then you size the system in such a way that even when a node goes down, there's enough capacity for carrying it on, you have, you have to have the right protocols, and so on, right? There's a whole bunch of hard work that goes on to make this work. But fundamentally, this, this, this particular architecture makes every SSD, all the data you put in SSDs, be real time. They are not as fast as accessing in memory. People go like, oh, but it's not as fast. Of course it's not as fast as memory. But if it's sub millisecond, point, you know, 200 microseconds, is that good enough? For most data applications I'm talking about, it's good enough. For the trade desk, it's good enough. For app nexus, it's good enough. For financial services doing fraud detection, it's not only good enough, it's necessary. Because if they have that, they can actually do business at, at a level of risk, which is, which is kind of palatable to, to, to the company as well as the, um, the board and all that. So, over the years, you know, we have worked on multiple configurations. Like, this is what everybody does. It is, everything is in DRAM, okay? And you, of course, back it up in this. We're in database, so you, you, you never directly read from rotational drive. And then, this one is going away. Guess how, the, so when we started the company, there was no PM. You know, this is Intel Optane Persistent Memory. Intel has announced that it is going to be shut down or, you know, it's going to go out of service in a few years, right? It's already got, done for, basically. So they didn't succeed. What this does is, you have 3x more data you can store in this. It is virtually, you know, almost as fast. It's faster, much faster. It's much closer to DRAM than it is to SSD in terms of access. That's what PMEM did. But that's gone. But we, you know, this is one thing we, we supported for, for several years. Continue to support it, of course, um, uh, for the next several years when Intel supports it. And then, this is our invention. See, that, that picture I showed you where you can directly access data from Drive, right? Then you have to write software. Where is the data? You have to build an index. Where do you keep the index? Do you keep the index on drive also? Is it fast enough? So we actually experimented with all that. So you initially started with index on DRAM and data is in flash. Okay. And that actually is called, you know, we call it the hybrid memory architecture, one of those patterns we talked about. But also, we added a hybrid PMEM in flash. We started putting the index in PMEM because you can do a 3x bigger index in every, every node. If you do 3x bigger index in every node, you have reduced you have increased the amount of real-time data you can store per node. So from being the, in an in-memory system, you can store as much real-time data as the size of your DRAM. You went from there to as much in-memory, uh, as much data as stored in SSDs, and then, which is limited by the amount of data which is stored in DRAM, which is basically the entire index has to be in DRAM, right? You can't be faulting for index. Then, what you have is, you can increase the size of the index with PMEM, which means you can increase the size of the SSDs for data. So now you, you basically are just making what, is called, what I call server compression happen. More and more real-time data per node, fewer nodes for larger systems. You know what? You can beat Google. That's what you do to beat Google. You don't spend the amount, you spend 10x less, and you're doing the same level of user experience, right? It's not even you, you're gonna be, nobody's gonna actually beat Google. You at least can compete and be in the same ballpark, which means you have a chance of success. It's really what's going on. Right? You're not, you're never, nobody's ever going to go head to head Google and what they're good at. You're going to go on the new things Google is doing with all the uh, resources they have. I'm just, I'm just taking Google as an example. Okay? It could be any large company in any industry okay? which is focused on the internet and scale. It has to be focused on real time SLAs and scale. Okay? If it's real time SLAs with a small number of users, then you don't, I don't think it's a big hard problem. With, with a lot of data but no real time SLAs, it's also not a hard problem. It's, together you combine it, it's a hard problem. You have to use every resource that is available in terms of hardware and technology and so on to do it. And that's what all of this is showing, okay? That's not enough. I talked about parallelism. You need to write, like, code. Like we talked about kerning it, all right? And, uh, re uh, and you know, the, the whole Unix thing. All written in C, okay? Multi-threaded. It basically, you know, it runs pretty much the internet. Linux runs the internet, right? What else does it know? So, so, so how is it? It, it, is, it is written with such good coding practices and technology, right? And, and I think that's important to bring to the table. And parallelism means you can't just be parallel on the SSD. You can be parallel on the network queue. You have to actually, you know, do NUMA pinning across CPU sockets. You can run two processes if you want. You know, you basically have multiple threads. Align the threads through the network queues. You make, you remove all the bottlenecks in the system. So you can now squeeze the headroom that you get out of a node. Is, a, is much, much bigger than what it was before. And therefore, you're cutting costs, right? But you don't care about cutting costs as much as you care about handling scale in an affordable manner. 
And that's, so this is all about you know, how to access all of the CPU memory network. There's a whole bunch of code you know, which needs to be written for that. Great. But then, what, if one writes a database, you have to shard the data. It is not an afterthought to me. When we started the project, we basically worked on this from ground up. We wrote our own code in C, etc., etc., and made sure that we have a certain level of partitioning, right? And, the, and we made sure, and we failed. But by the way, when we started 12 years ago, we didn't have even amount of data on every node because it would kind of vary, you know, it was random. We actually had to add an algorithm about six to seven, seven, six to seven years ago for what is called uniform data partitioning or uniform balancing. Because we had to actually tweak our algorithms to keep getting more and more, uh, you know, uh, keep getting better to use all these resources, the hardware resources that are available to our software, right? And, and, and that's really important, right? And then you have to load balance continually. It's kind of hard because nodes can die at any point in time. And then what? Where is the data? You have a replica, but how do you move the data? It takes a long time to move the data. I'm talking about terabytes and petabytes, you know, we talked about, you know, uh, those big numbers, right? When you have that much data, it, it's not like it's going to take some time to move. Then what do you do in the meantime, right? So, so then you have to kind of have a way of uh, parallelism, right? And then when you have multiple nodes, what is showing here is, you know, if you have a three node cluster, you have 33% of data, and, you, know, you know, that's kind of one, one over three. Then you add a new node, what do you do? You have to move data from each of these nodes to the new node, right? And it has to move uniformly. You can't take one node and move everything there, then it doesn't work. So, so you got to do, there's a whole random algorithm and so on, I won't go into, but, but that's really important to do this without hard spots. It's not hard to do sharding, by the way. Can you do sharding without hot spots is a hard problem. And you know what? Aerospike doesn't actually do that. We use an algorithm called the RipeMD160, which is a you know, cryptographic hash function, which enables us to have that uniform distribution. And then we've added uniform distribution when we map the partitions that we have to nodes. We had to tweak it at a level where the partitions are also distributed uniformly across nodes. And then you get true uniform load across this with auto sharding and no. And so it, it, it was several years of effort. Uh, based on, you know, like MD160, which is not invented by us. It's available to anybody, actually. But you have to do the hard work to make it work. And then the other thing that we spend a lot of time uh, refining is how the clients to a cluster, how do they access the cluster? You know, essentially, we do it with a single hop. We have a map in terms of where the data is in the cluster. This is what sharding is all about, right? All the clusters share the information. They know when nodes go out, how to re you know, re reshare the information and move data around. The client keeps a copy of the map. The client's copy is not required for consistency. It's not required for even working. It can go slowly. It can always do a level of indirection to the cluster. You go to any node in the cluster and get the data. The cluster has a shared copy, right? However, that doesn't work. In a, you know, if you want to linearly scale your load, the first user and the billionth user, you need to basically make sure a client can work, you know, provide you know, enormous load on the cluster, but the cluster and the client, you know, can provide this enormous load, and the cluster should be able to run with our hotspot at a very high level of performance. Okay? And that requires us to be very light in terms of what the client requires of the cluster, and that's why it shares this uh, map, and then it knows which node to send the actual request to. That's really fundamentally important. Then you, then you put these together. Okay? You can do hotspots. You can basically have a client having the shared map. Now you got to figure out how to add or remove or update a, a node without disruption to the client load. The way you do that is you basically when a node goes away, the client can detect that the node went away. So there'll be a few timeouts, right? It has to happen. But then very quickly the client can share that map. It's typically, you know, uh, we've played with the various numbers there. It could be 30 seconds, it could be, you know, one second, it could be half second, whatever, when, when, the, when, the, when the server map gets updated on the client. You can only up get the updated map from a server you can connect to. The server is dead, it's dead, okay? You, you, you can't connect to it. The client can't, that's the definition of the server not being accessible. The server may not actually be dead, it may be just partition. It's possible, right? So all of this means that you now have a way to, um, you know, to figure out uh, with the help of the clients and the server uh, to figure out how to readjust things. And that has to happen without actually, uh, okay, 
that's the real time SLA we talked about. So you gotta have enough headroom in the system when a node goes down that you have enough headroom, first of all, to run the load. That's the minimum requirement. But you need more than that. You need enough headroom, not only to run the lo lo load that you was running with the, with the extra node, but also to rebalance the cluster. But then you should be able to map, map these things back and forth. And th those things are, you know, there's a whole bunch of optimization algorithms one has to work on. So, to summarize, you have, you know, Everything running on flash, hybrid memory with memory index and flash storage. This is memory is going away, but it's, it's both index and, uh, and then there's in memory, right? You get better SLAs. It's more expensive as you go up here. So you have to do fewer terabytes, right? As you go up to the memory. You can't put your, a system which is more, more expensive, you know, larger in the top one. It, this, you know who can afford this? The Googles, Facebooks is one they can afford this. Rest of us or somewhere here. And you know what? That's good enough to, to be successful at scale. That's one lesson I've learned. That's the lesson of Aerospike over the years. That we can enable anybody to be successful and compete with the best in the world. Even though they have all the resources. Because we know what they're doing? They're spending it all here. Great. Go spend it. Memories, the technology isn't improving that much. The, the improvement all came down here. And they're going to continue to continue to do that. Now CXL is coming in memory. You know what? We're going to be there on it. It's not like we're not going to be on it. But the point is, whatever technology comes out there, <laughs> you know, my, my view is, you just go figure out how to make it work for real-time SLAs. Since I'm focused on real-time SLAs at scale, that's what we're going to do. So look at that. A memory optimized instance, 5 terabyte data, 39 nodes. The same thing, if I can get away with it, sub millisecond response time, storage optimized, this is, these are real instances in, in, in Amazon, okay? It's not necessarily the most current, but there are more. You, you know, you can look at it, i4i's, for example, are much more um, current. This is just to compare. 39 nodes, 6 nodes. This is why we were picked at, you know, in the, in the early days by AppNexus and TradeNet. That's what picks you. If they are looking at this thing, small company, they have, like, big aims. How am I going to grow there? With 10,000 machines? No. You know what? If I get to 1,000 machines in a few years, and I start off with like 10, I go 1,000, you know, 100x, right? That's enough. Usually to, to you know, that, that's what unlimited scale to me means. Right? That's what I'm trying to talk about here. That, you know, so you're just always staying ahead of what, what is required. And again, lows, these are like uh, real benchmarks, okay? 20 nodes for a petabyte database, millions of transactions a second. Eight nodes in a bare metal. These are not even done by Aerospike. These are done by, like, this, is, this is done with Amazon and Intel, and that's what's done with HP and Intel. Okay? Well, you know, and, and again, you know, unfortunately, or fortunately, I, I don't even want to comment on it, which way or that. This is the future. Everybody is using cloud, right? There's a subset of people who will still use that, but that's okay. You know what I mean? Everybody wants to use uh, uh, cloud first. And then cloud is actually becoming, and we are working with cloud vendors. We just all trying to work together to figure out with storage vendors, cloud vendors, you know. We work with all the storage vendors. We work with all the cloud vendors. How to make things more efficient for the SLA-based workloads on all these platforms, okay? That, that is the whole basis of this. Okay, so now we talked about SLAs. Um, does anybody want to have any, uh, ask any questions on this, or we, we can wait to the end also? Maybe I can allow one or two if you want. Okay. So, so stop me if you, if you something is completely not gelling or not clear. Consistency. A database needs to keep its data safe, right? So here is an example of strong consistency right logic. This is a three-copy system. Replication factor is three. Okay. So what happens is, you basically have a request, it goes to a master, okay, I didn't explain the partitioning, but basically Aerospike divides its data into 1496 partitions. And what happens is, when you have those partitions, partitions are mapped to nodes, and you have three copies, one of them will be the master for the partition, and again, master is not like fixed, it'll be at that point in time with the nodes in this cluster, that's how the mapping works. And then you go to the master for the partition, the master will coordinate um, a write across multiple replicas, right? So you'll have three 
in this case, one, two, three, it happens. And there's a whole protocol which happens, right? If you just have two copies, you can be really efficient. Because when, uh, uh, if you're familiar with database commit semantics, so if there are only two, two actors in it, so if the first one finishes something and sends it to the second one, the second one commits it, second one knows the commit point has been reached. You're done, basically. After that, it's just a matter of communicating back and forth. On the other hand, if you have three copies, so the first one writes, then it has to know both of them have written, and it has to come back. So the commit semantics can only happen to the master. That's what this is trying to say. This is where there is an advice replicated. It goes from the master to the, the, the other copies, only when the replication factor is three or more. If you have two copies, you can actually have an efficiency here, which makes it really fast. And one of the things I'll show you later is, Aerospike, we worked really hard to make strong consistency work in a distributed system with two copies in the normal case. Because there is a, a theorem by Leslie Lamport where you absolutely need three copies to maintain strong consistency in a distributed data system. But the three copies, in our opinion, are not needed all the time. I'll show you some of that as we go through this. That's really important, okay? And these are the, well, what is this? This, is, this goes directly to TCO. So if I can run Aerospike in a strongly consistent mode at delivering the SLAs, uptime and all of that with two copies, and you have to have three copies with some other system because the theorem is saying that, that means we have not optimized it, right? We always have three copies. We don't need all three copies always. But there are some cases where you need more than two copies to be consistent in a, a distributed system, right? And we do that. So we just optimize it. Just like we optimize hardware, we optim optimize our network access, our CPU and memory. We also optimize our distributed algorithms. It's just work that you have to think about and do. And it's hard because we didn't know we could even do that when we started it. Okay, this is one of those things where you, like, you go like, okay, is it going to work or not? It's, and then there was some intelligent um, work done by some of our engineers who made it happen. So that's, that's for writing. Okay, what did I do? Okay, so I was here, write logic. Now, read logic. Now, read logic is slightly separate. These are two independent things. So, you have various kinds of reads that can happen. One is, you want to have linearizable read. You want a linearizable read, you have to read from the master, and you have to go check that the replicas are on the same generation, as we call it, or same regime. Basically, you can't have a cluster split and one of those replicas being a different thing, and you, you, know, you need to basically resolve these things if you are strongly consistent as a database. You can't just say, I have this data, so it's the data. That's not good enough. You need to know if it is the data the database thinks is the right data for an application to read based on other reads and writes that have happened before, right? And that's linearizable. And, and in order to do that, you have to actually look at all the copies. You don't have to look at the data of all the copies to read it, but you have to take the data from any one of them, provided the other copies agree with you. You at least have to go check that if, if you want to do linearizable. Now there is an optimization you can do for sequential consistency, but you still have to go to the master to read. You can't just read from any replica. If you read from any replica, then you won't get sequential consistency. There's some tricks we can do to get there, but we haven't done that, you know. But, but I think we, we can eventually get there. But you can get read committed, which means you only read committed data of committed transactions. However, it's possible if you go read from a replica, you might read, and, and, then, and then later a master, and then again from a replica, you might get a transaction commit value for an item, which is prior to a read you already made. Because the things haven't propagated. These are all committed values. So there's no, uh, you're not reading dirty reads or anything in the database parlance. But they are out of order. So they are not sequentially consistent. So there are these trade-offs you have to do when you do this. But you can do all of this with two copies. We passed the Jepson test, if for those of you who know database stuff, right? So I won't go into all the details here, but I just want to point out a couple of things in this, okay? This is a five-node system, and it is run on a concept called the roster. So the Aerospike cluster essentially knows, in this case, it's a strongly consistent cluster. There are other clusters, uh, uh, algorithms in Aerospike, which are not strongly consistent, okay? But that's also allowed. Any database will allow levels of consistency. Though I'm only talking about the most strongly consistent here, for writes. You never lose a write, 
you will never read you know a, you know if you if you follow the read logic you will never read any data which is um, which is dirty or which is which is basically not committed which is linearizable you know you can basically just check all these various consistency levels in this particular case i'll just point out uh, one you know a couple of things okay because this is fairly involved so in this case there's a roster and there are two copies in the system and, and, and note four, let's just take one partition, some partition P, okay, pick a number, your favorite number. That's the number, of the, it's between, you know, 0 and 4095, okay, those are the partition numbers. So let's say 1000, partition P is 1000. 1000 partition, the master happens to be in node 5 and the replica happens to be in node 4, okay. We have some rules. If there is a split of this cluster along the line where 1, 2 and 3 are in one, you know, split into one cluster, four and five are another cluster, because the master and replica for that partition 1000 are both contained in the smaller cluster, it doesn't matter at the point, that cluster is active for that partition 1000. That's the rule, okay? It's important to, you know, you'll see why the rule is important when you go to the next rule, okay? If that is not true, if both the master and replica are not in any subcluster, and you find that then you go to a majority minority rule, which is the next split is five splits off, but one, two, three, and four are together. This is this happens, you know, essentially at that point in time. Then what happens is, even though the master for partition one thousand happens to be in node five, it can't do anything because the majority cluster here has the other one which is pretty, you know, it is the, it is the, rest, the replica there on 4. Our rule is, you can continue, provided for every new write that's happening, you create another, another replica, that is, this happens to be in 3. Okay? This is the third copy showing up. Without the third copy, you can't break the tie. You just can't. You know, in this case, what happens is we shut down uh, the, the, the other one, and then we create these two things, and now when there is another failure, I won't go into that, but basically we can continue to run the system even when one node is up. So you basically, if there are two copy system, when one node is down, you can get both consistency and availability with this algorithm. What does that mean? That of course there's an extra effort for that, because we keep an extra copy and all that for all the changes that are happening when, when these changes are happening to the cluster. But what it means is you can do a rolling upgrade of the system on a two copy system with no downtime basically with strong consistency see you can easily do downtime you can easily run a system with no downtime it's kind of hard enough uh, no downtime but it's actually doing a rolling upgrade okay but but you you have some uh, consistency issues some people may be okay with that but if you're doing money transfer applications they're not going to be okay with that if your FedEx uh, shipping is happening, yeah, I'll be open to that. A user checks, oh, your, 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 your data is now, you know, let's say, you know, let's say New York, right? Uh, we're stuck in Chicago. So, so let's say uh, the stuff showed up in uh, Chicago. Next time you look, it's still back in Mountain View. You're not going to like that. You're going to get a call, hey, we, you, you know, the, the, I thought the packet was already in Chicago. Why is the, the system showing me that now it's still not shipped? You know what happened? This Basically, they, they're looking at the wrong copy. Something got a split brain. If you're not consistent, you'll get that kind of answer. Not acceptable in a lot of applications. All of that gets avoided uh, the way we are doing it. So a rolling upgrade will have uptime and consistency. You know what that means for an operational person? They can do a rolling upgrade during the middle of the day. You don't know. You know I've talked to enough ops people over the years. I don't know. Some of you, are, did any of you here do operations on these difficult systems? You, you will understand why it's important to do it in the middle of the day, when you're awake. Not in the middle of the night, <laughs> when nobody's awake and you're the only one awake. It's nuts. This, is, this, this, this used to be a thing. In the early days of uh, Citrus, it used to be a thing. Eventually, we realized with the app next people, hey, why are we doing this stupid thing in the middle of the night? We're both in the US. Okay? I'm in California, they're in New York. We're sitting there in the middle of the night, trying to figure out this thing. Eventually, we decided, you know what, let's do this. Let's just make sure that there is enough headroom we're going to do it in the middle of the day when we are all fresh and we can drink coffee, I can do stuff, you know, I'm not in the, you know, and that works. And what, what, is, so you think about that, then you come up with algorithms like this. 
So you don't have to worry about consistency, you don't have to do it when there's a minimal load and all that nonsense, right? The, all of that goes away. So is, I'm just trying, trying to get you to think that we can do things better, but you have to spend a lot of time and effort to do this. It is not, it's not obvious. Okay, and not everybody does this. That's the other thing that I let you judge that, but not everybody even thinks about these things. They go like, well, it works for me, like, you know, with like a 2,000 users, man, let's ship it. And guess what, it's just gonna crash and burn. So many companies have crashed and burned. We just don't hear about it. Because you never hear, they never get to the level. The only ones we hear are the ones who are already successful. Then you go further. That's not good enough, right? I just did, then how about rack aware? Why don't we set the system with two copies with two racks? So all the data is in each rack. <coughs> so my apps can now read locally from a replica, you know, so long as you're willing to set the level of consistency to the level that you want, you can now have apps which are less than one milliseconds, all reach less than one milliseconds, and no matter where the racks are, the writes are the only ones get affected. You just raised your level of availability for certain kinds of applications and use cases, right? So now you have a rack-based system. Now you can still <coughs> choose linearizable, which case you have to go check both copies for reads. Session consistency, you have to go to the master for reads. You have to cross, basically, you have an app running here, the master is here, you have to go there, or you have to go there for session For read committed, you can just read the local one. So if you're okay with read committed, if you can live with the occasional thing where the stuff is not right, then you go back and do a proper li li linearizable read or whatever read you wanted to do for the next request. You don't pay the penalty for every read. You only pay it for the things which missed, which might not even happen. Because you can detect it. You can keep track of the fact that you have a regime or, or a version number of an item, and then you read it later. Oh my goodness, now this item is, is earlier within a certain time frame. You can do that. So, so you now have more flexibility. Okay. And then it gets even better. If you're willing to keep three copies and three racks, and then, you know, you know this, this is three copies and, yeah, there are three racks and two copies. It's two copies and three racks. Now you need two of those, uh, uh, you know, racks to be available for the system to be up. This is where, you know, whichever two is up is what you get. And there is no operating intervention required in this. But you do have to, you know, reads can be, if it's going to the local one for the app, or the, or, you know, if your master is somewhere else, you have, a, you have an issue, okay? Because not every data item is going to be there in every rack, right? That's what, you know, you have two copies and three racks, so some of it is like not there in your rack. You can't read locally. So you, have, you always have to cross for some requests, right? So it could be like some number of milliseconds more than one. Right, so of course going to be slow because of the, so this is another copy. But then, you can do three copies and three racks. Now with read committed, I can do one millisecond for everything. And you know what? The data center goes away, it continues the rest of them. I'm not going to go into the details of it. It just continues. No operating intervention. Nothing required. Okay? Now what, you just raise your level up, right? Your uptime just goes up. You're, you're maintaining all the things that you want to do. You're maintaining performance. You're maintaining... So, so is, is it, are we not having any trade-offs? Of course we are having a trade-off. When one, the, one of these goes out, your app now can't be local all the time. It has to cross. The re reads, reads are going to get slower, depending on the distance between these two racks, because now I may not have all the data locally if this rack is not there. But how often is that going to happen? But I didn't have any operator to intervene. You know, it, it actually works. And then when the rack comes back on, it works. You can use it for a rolling upgrade. Now comes the beautiful rolling upgrade. Instead of doing one node at a time, I do three nodes at a time. I take the whole thing out. Everything's fine. Bring the whole thing up, okay? And then take the whole thing out, do the upgrade. It works. People do this all the time. So now we've just raised it to another level of how we can um, operate the system, right? So, so it's, it's like we start with hardware, you know, like the storage part. Then we, then we started with, um, uh, and then, then we talked about uh, the CPU and network and memory. And then we said we're going to optimize the algorithms, you know, two copies instead of three. And then we go like, well, we're optimizing operations. Everything matters when you run these global systems. You know what? This is what Google spends all its time on, I'm sure, or the Facebook. This is what they're spending all their time on. They can run it with no downtime. Everything runs, right? How is it? They're doing all this stuff. Can we kind of make it available to everybody else? They're not going to do that. They're going to open source the slowest system they build. That's what they do. And then the whole world is like running around, like trying to fix the slowest system for like decades. I mean, I mean, you see that, I mean, you're laughing, but I mean, this is literally what happened. Uh, they're not doing it intentionally. Let's be very clear. 
I'm not accusing them of anything. I'm saying that's what happens. Because if something is mission critical to me as a company, I'm not open sourcing that. Why would I? I mean, it doesn't make any sense. I wouldn't want them to be there. Because I'm a, I'm a Google customer too. I want, I want the best from them, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, async actor, and then the other thing, right? And you go further than that. Now, we, we talked about synchronous and consistency and so on. But there is another side to this. What if I want both fast reads and writes, but I am willing to compromise on consistency by making it asynchronous application? Yes, please. Uh, just to make sure, when you're talking about all this, you are data agnostic, application agnostic, or are you just at a database level? I'm at the database level. You're at the database yeah. level. I want to make sure anything coming into the database using my APIs, I can provide certain guarantees. This is the same thing Oracle does, same thing relational databases do. No difference. This is your own database here, or is this? This is all based on the experience at Aerospike. Okay, but what database are you using? Aerospike is the one. Aerospike. We didn't use the database, we built it. Uh -huh. okay, I got this is about uh, all the things that applications require. We went through all this uh, requirement and you know, working with people for like almost a decade or more. And this is what they threw at us. <laughs> this is the response <laughs> you're, you're hearing. Okay? And, and this is just asynchronous stuff. Okay? That's all it's saying. Which means that you can have a database with full data. Each one is a cluster. And you can run on multiple clouds, wherever you want. What do you have? You pay a lot of money when you transfer the data back and forth, the cloud. But you also have the ability to have very good SLAs on each of those systems. You don't cross. For your right. you, you, you're willing to wait for a transaction committed in one location to appear in another location. That may not be a possibility for a FedEx or a money transfer al algorithm, but it could be okay for a lot of other things. Like, you know, you change your settings on something, you know what? It's okay, you know, settings will show up. Because I'm not moving, right? If I'm, I, I'm now in New York, right? I mean, but I'm not going to move from New York. Um, I don't know, it's going to take me minimum, like, you know, take a, like a rocket, it's going to take like minutes. Right? And all I have is like a car or a plane. It's going to take hours, uh, tens of minutes to go to like New Jersey or whatever. You so it doesn't matter. So by the time it will be synced. It takes one second to sync worldwide. That's what all it's saying. Okay. So, so, we, we, so th there are applications where the uh, vast majority of them can work like this. Your email can sync this way. Uh, maybe it syncs like that. And the interesting thing is once you have data which can be synced back, you know, back and forth, we, we did a lot of work on this thing. Okay. Uh, we, we, we call it XDR in Aerospike. We started working on it in 2012 because the first thing we did was the transaction stuff, and then we started doing this XDR thing. Where and then what happened was uh, it was driven by a company in New York, you know, um, basically you're called Excelate, you know, and they got eventually acquired by Nielsen. Okay, they're based in Israel and here. Um, and then basically what they did was they essentially um, used this for the whole DMP, you know. But the, uh, what happens when you start doing this is you have all these uh, systems you run on the edge for this high-performance SLA thing, and then you realize you have a lot of data you don't need immediately. You only need what you need now. And then you know what? You don't want to throw away all the other stuff. So you put it somewhere here. Then what do you do with it? You start processing it with various kinds of things. Hey, what did I do that day? You know, what, did I, what happened in last year when this happened, this event happened? Is that event happening now? You know, if it happens next time, what do I do? This is what fraud detection is all about. Okay, I, we found the fraud, we didn't catch it last time. How can we make sure we can catch these kinds of things in the future? And also things we have not thought about. Right? So they start like running these models and so on on this data, not just the latest data, but all the data. You know, there's a, there, there's a company I know which basically wants to show all the trades their customers have done for 15 years. Right? And they can do that with the kind of architecture I'm talking about. Because it doesn't cost, you have tiers. You don't have to put everything in the, in the hard tier. You put it in the middle tier. You can put it in the third tier. Okay? We keep adding tiers. Every three or four years, we add a new tier. Okay? And this is just because of hardware vendors. Right? Now, S3 is a tier. So you can put data in S3 if you can put an index on it. Right? So, so there are things we can do uh, which enables you to start running, uh, connecting this to multiple systems. And that fundamentally what this thing is all about. Change data capture from systems can then move. Now we, we this happens to be an aerospace example, but event stream processing is a connector we did. From which you can go into Amazon. You can also go into Google, okay? I mean it's GCP. You can go wherever you want. You can take the data that is changing in your database, which can absorb the ingest, and you can filter it with some dynamic links, and then you can just add more links, ship it off with a filter to wherever it, it needs to go. And then and look at it. And right? once you get into AWS Lambda, this is not us. You can do whatever you want. 
you know, AWS has done all the work. See, this is the same thing. It's not like hardware people, do, vendors do it and we, we take care of it. We, we, we use it. We use the same thing with cloud. But we have to build those intermediate things so an application can put data into a system and just moves where and where. And look at this weirdness, right? So Aerospike, this happened, goes to Lambda. We can go to a REST client, back to Aerospike if you want. I'm sure you can go to a REST client and go put it in Cassandra. Wherever you want to put it, I don't care. The point is, the point is to allow the data to move. That's the second part, right? The geo distribution means making stuff work globally, but also to allow stuff to move globally. They're two different things. They're related. You might, you might have both in the same uh, system architecture. Finally, okay, this is the hardcore database stuff, and I do describe the partitioning scheme here. It's 4K partitions, okay. And then you, you're mapping partitions, you go, this is the IPMP 160 I talked about. Take a key, you get a digest. You take 12 bits of the digest, assign a partition ID. Okay, it's fully randomized. And then those partitions are now mapped to nodes. That's basically it. Okay? And then what is the objective? Distribute data. So this is this goes hand in hand with the no hotspots hot spots thing I talked about. You know? And this is a naturally assigned thing. This is not ours, right? IPMP 160 is a randomized function. And then you get, how do you read it, rebalance it, scale up and down by adding it. Talked about how you can do it with two copies and so on. Uh, but all of that I think you can do. And then what do you do? You make sure that every node can operate by itself. That's fundamentally important. There are no special types of nodes you need in a distributed system. You need one, you know, one type of node which kind of connect to other, other nodes which are of the same type and be able to do everything. It's a fundamentally interesting way to think about this because the problem is by itself hard. We don't have to make it harder by having different types of nodes. You just increase the level of complexity now. We have three types of nodes, forget it. I don't think, we, I do not have the capacity to make it work right with a, with a good thing, right? I mean, I, I, so we, we try to keep it simple. And then see how to make, and of course the, co the node itself becomes complex because the algorithms become, and then you have to simplify that. So you need to have like, you know, our, our uh, chief architect is essentially um, a PhD in astrophysics. Go figure. He figures he, he figure software is easier than solving the universe. <laughs> so, and, and, and that works for him and it works for us. Is that, that's a consistent hashing kind of problem? It is like that, but it's not exactly that. It, it is a, uh, if you're familiar with Cassandra, uh, there, there, is, there are two ways you can run it. One, you can run it with linear hashing. That's not this. It is the other one where you can you can basically map randomly uh, partitions to nodes and then move those mappings around. That's what we do. And we do our own algorithm for that, which makes it balanced. So there's a massively parallel architecture. It's very important. And I'm not going to go into the details. Um, um, you see every node. I don't know what happened there. Okay. I, I think it got translated. It's slightly different. But there's actually a line here. Doing like that. To this. So each node has those five drives. Okay, it's five times four. There's 20 way parallelism by definition. And then you can add that, add on to that multi threading in you know, a multiple sockets. So you can get a lot, you know, this is 30 way by default. You can do a lot more than that, okay? And with all the partitions, you add the partitions to it. So, so you have 4K partitions, you have 20, you know, in this particular cluster, you have 20 things. So th those are the kinds of partition levels of uh, parallelism you're talking about. Secondary indexes, the interesting thing about databases is there are two constructs available to you. One is indexing, right, for data processing, which means you reduce the amount of data you're going to process because you built an index. So you do this work all the time by adding this index entry, every time thing update happens, you're just doing a little bit of work all the time, okay? Except the first time you need to build an index on data, it doesn't have an index, you do a lot of work, okay? You do, do the whole thing and you build the index. After that, you do a little bit of work every time thing changes. What does it give you? When you actually have to find something, you've already done all the work. You just go and say, hey, I have a secondary index, I want to find people in the zip code. <coughs> boom, you go zip code, boom. But every time somebody gets added to the database, you got to put them in the zip code index. You know, when they remove, when they move, you remove it from one in zip code index, put them in another one. You do all that work. You don't want to rebuild the index all the time. So you rebuild it once and then you keep on updating, right? Now you're, you're really efficient, you reduce the amount of data. What is the other thing that, is, that helps? Parallelism. When you have a fixed amount of data you have to do, you do it in parallel. Netisa, classic example. Right? Every database does it. Right? So you need to use both. When you have both, 
then that's what secondary index. So you can actually do because of the clustering mechanism I, I showed you in the previous. Like, you know, you have you have nodes and you have disks, and now you have a problem to solve on this. You basically have a secondary index, and you co-locate it with a primary index, which is distributed, and then you fire the query to all of those nodes. And then each of those nodes is processing in multiple threads, multiple partitions, whatever, and going against these multiple disks. So now you have both indexing and parallelism. I don't think you can do better than that. That's the best you can do. So that's be, no, that means you're like, you don't have to pick one or the other. You no need to. You can pick both if it works for you. Right? That's important. So we co-locate the, you know, that's kind of stuff we do. So it's a basic simple idea, you know, you, you take the secondary index, you hash it, find the place where it is, the B tree typically, and then you go find where in the primary index it is. And then you can optimize the thing, okay? So instead of storing a digest and looking at the primary index, you stick the actual pointer out to where the primary index entry is in the secondary index, because it's all local in one node, it's local for a partition, you can split it into pieces, you have a piece for every partition, you have 4K partitions split across all these nodes. So whatever partition the node has, it can do all this. So when you then do a partition-based query, you can just fire the thing in a, in a partition. You can fire four partitions per node, and each of those things. So you now have a level of parallelism to compute this, uh, to query it, which is really, really, really important for you to leverage. Right? So we're putting all of this together in secondary indexes. Now it doesn't stop there. Once you have a platform which can actually process data in parallel, you can look at other platforms which process data in parallel. Spark, right? He does an amazingly good parallel architecture with worker threads and figuring out how to split a piece, you know, a big job into small things, giving the data pieces to each of these things. Okay, you know what? You can just take that and now with Spark you have to stick everything in memory, right? I just took you through the whole presentation where Aerospike can treat SSD as memory and various other things as memory. It has indexing and so on, right? So what do you do when you have a Spark uh, problem which doesn't fit in DRAM? Or you have a problem which is like a petabyte, 10 petabyte scale, whatever it is. You build indexes. You, you basically then figure out what kind of processing you want to do. And you know you have an enormous level of parallelism available on a partition by partition basis. You map all of the Spark uh, you know, processes and what they do to the Aerospike clusters, whatever mechanism. You know, I've used Aerospike clusters as an example. But you have a put it, on, and the database has to be extremely parallel, and it also has to support indexing. You can push the predicate in here, so the data doesn't get transferred into Spark as much as possible. And then whatever gets transferred is processed in parallel, both here and here. Now you have a system which can do without, you know, you don't have to worry about like, okay, you know what? You're reaching unlimited scale right there. Otherwise you're stuck. If you use one of the two techniques, you're stuck. If you don't use the distribution, you're stuck. You seek, you, stay, you know, you put three copies, you're stuck. See, everything will stick you with a level where you can't compete against the people who have unlimited amount of money. The goal is to compete and win with people without the unlimited amount of money, right? So you got to use our smarts for it. That's what, that's what all this is about. So we can do the same thing with SQL. Presto is another great architecture, which essentially is a query processing architecture, right? You know, we talked about DB2 in the early part, you know, and, 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 and Eric introduced me. Every database has a query processing layer as well as a data layer and a parallel layer, right? We have talked about the data and parallel layer, which at Aerospike, you know, myself and my team has worked on it quite a bit on that. But we do not believe we are capable of also doing the query processing thing at the same time. It's not like we're not smart enough or they're smarter, or, you know, they're probably smarter in different ways than us. But the point is, they've already done it. It's working. SQL has been around for a long time. And there's a huge query processing engine which Presto is successful with. Why can't we just put them together? They also have a parallel concept. They, they call them splits. Right? Aerospike, but you know, you can map it. Same thing that we did in Spark. Spark worker threads against Aerospike partition thing. Same thing with uh, splits in Presto. Uh, map it to Aerospike. Now you can now solve a big scale problem again. Now again you can push the indexing into Aerospike. Because if you push the indexing go close to data, you get less data into Presto where you can do complex things like joins and various other processing you want to do. So you're not going to miss the fact that there is no SQL in the underlying you know, data platform that we're talking about because this is going to give it to you. And they've done a good job of it. right? And you can do all kinds of queries in it. So that is essentially the main part of the talk, and I can spend maybe like you know a few minutes showing you where you can find more information. Okay. So just one slide. So this this kind of just a picture which tells you that 
you know, you can use Aerospike everywhere. But I think I already talked about it. And it works with Presto, Spark, Kafka, whatever other things you want, right? So it's not, not a big deal. This is what I want to get to. What can you do with it, right? You can do a lot of things with it. You can do document, key value, you know, JSON, you know, various uh, things that you have. You can go look up in Aerospike. Uh, what is available in the documentation page and so on. But I want to show you, now I'm going to go to, um, okay, this is always a, uh, when you try to do a demo or something, or show something which is live, it's always fun, because we don't know if it's going to work or not. Um, I mean, it, it fails even for Bill Gates and Steve Jobs, so I don't see why it would be any different for me. Um, let's start with document API. Okay, so, so here is um, a setup, um, you know, this is basically a, a document, uh, this is a code sandbox, so I just made a developer at aerospec.com, okay, you can go to developer at aerospec.com and you can look at the code sandbox, and, the, and I picked the document specifically, so there are other things here, okay, simple key value stuff, but this is a document thing I picked, uh, and then you can go in there and let's say, let's set up something, right, I mean, there's a whole bunch of code here. It's, 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 it's figuring out how to connect. Let's see if it works. There's a console there. It's launching a session in binder and Okay, I'll really do it. It's doing something. Loading and loading and loading. Okay, Aerospike's database is running. So you didn't even have to install anything, right? It's, it's all done. Now, let's go create something, a document. So what it's doing here is it's going to, to a client, it's all fine, and then, to, and then it's, it's finding a bunch of space companies. It's, it's talking about uh, all the companies which run on um, space stuff. So it's gonna run. Okay, so it can't find symbol, right? This is what happened to me earlier. Let's go back. Or maybe I didn't even connect to the band. Okay. Did I press this thing? I think I thought I did it. Oh, there's nothing. Okay, setup complete. See, I should have waited. It tells me setup is complete according to this. Now maybe we should, we should run. That's it. Yes! Nice. Document added it. So it's, it's added something to the database. Let's still see what the heck it added. Let's read it, right? Okay, so it's added, up, it's added all these space companies to the database. Okay, so just something it's added. Okay. So you can go play around with it. I'm not going to uh, bore you with a lot of this stuff. But you can go, if this is available. You just go to the developer or database.com and try it. Now you can also do an update. Now we're going to add a specific, um, we're going to add an entry, okay, to CERN. Uh, a testimonial, basically, from a person um, called Rebecca. Okay, so we add this. Okay, so so there it is. This is the first one. This was there before. PD Live was on, and this is the one that we just added. This is what you know, she writes about her summer internship at CERN. So that is, and then you can go delete it. So you can you can go change the code, by the way. You can do whatever you want, okay? So uh, that's the beauty of this is like, it's already set up for you. You have blank, right? So now you go and uh, you can write your own code, okay? That's number one. Let's see what else. Okay, I want to show you the Jupyter Notebook next. Um, what did you do? I think this is the Spark. This is the Spark load store thing, okay? So now, um, the second thing, let's click and wait. So, so this is a Jupyter Notebook. Um, we built for loading Spark and Aerospike data together. You do Aerospike data, and then you first create it um, in Spark, store it in Aerospike, and then you go to Aeros and go to Spark again and start doing other things with it. Okay. So you can you can put data in and then get data out, assuming this error comes back. I did test all of this, but uh, I'm sure everybody does that. 
unless it's like uh, somebody's doing maintenance on this thing, which is the one thing I talked about. Okay, this is taking too long. Maybe while it's coming up, I can go to... Let's try. Well, let's look at the Presto stuff. Right. This one is just uh, documentation. There's nothing here, so you can go to the Presto you know, Connect slash Presto on the Aerospike site, and you can you can find out what are the supported SQL statements. Um, you know, how do you map data between Aerospike and Presto? And you can basically this is how the architecture works. This is what I was talking about, right? So we have a parallel architecture. Other people have parallel architecture. How do you map the two things? You know, uh, it is definitely important. So this, this is kind of, and once you know this, you can basically go uh, and essentially look at some examples. You know, there's a simple select query, secondary index query. You know, all of this is, is out there. You, you can try it out. Okay, so this thing is dead. So I'm going to try opening it again. Um, and this is the last time I open it. So this is. I don't know why. Okay, so now I, I press this and it didn't come back, right? Okay, look at all the stuff is there. Yeah. Everything is here. So if, if this worked, you would be able to execute all of these commands um, on, on the thing. That's what I was going to show you, but I guess it doesn't seem to want to come up like that. Let's try... Um, okay, I'll give up on it then. So I do have another thing running here. Oh! It's now returning something. Okay. So lucky day, I guess. Okay, it's out here, okay? So, so this is a simple, I mean, all, all you do with Binder, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, with uh, Jupyter Notebook, you can just run it, okay? So, it's basically setting up, ensure the database is running, it says. So now, let me run it, right? I'm gonna run it. So let's see if it, yeah, Elspite database is running, okay? Came back, it's good. Um, so you just, you just go run through this, you can look at the, look at the code. This is all available again in, 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 on, on our developer hub. Uh, so you can then go do this. You know, it's importing. See, it's importing all the Spark stuff, and then you can just keep doing. It's it's using PySpark, the Python version. You keep doing that. See, it's, it's creating a Spark content. Now it's going to store. It's going to generate data in Spark and store it in Aerospike. Okay, what's it doing? It's actually simple salary data with a specified distribution in the following structure: integer, name, string, age, and salary. Okay. And, and, and what it's doing is, uh, it's doing three covariance matrices, okay? So you, you can basically, uh, so it, it did that, right? Data has been created. So and now, it's gonna display the data. See, it, it shows up in three matrices, right? So look at it here. So let's go, let's go down. Okay, so now I'm gonna display the data. So this is all till it's part, okay? This is how the data showed up, okay? Now we're gonna, finally, we're gonna store it, in this case, in Aerospike. It's changing it into, it's turning into a data frame, right? And that's the important thing, right? And then there's a spark connector. See, you see the parallelized thing? It can do stuff in parallel, it's really important. And then you can also push, and I, I don't think we we're showing the index thing here, but so, So now, now, now I'm going to run a, run a query directly on Aerospike. That's what it's trying to do. There's a thing called a, a tool, which I'm running. So we select star. So it selected all this data. This is just stored by Spark. Right? The way Jupyter Notebook works is it already puts the, what is supposed to be there, and you run it, and it shows you know, it should be the same thing. Uh, hold on. Okay. Now we go here. Now data is in Aerospike. We know it's there. Now we are going. Now we have the data in Aerospike, right? So we, now we're going to load it without schema. See, what, are, what, what is stored, right? We just stored a bunch of stuff. Well, what, what exactly did we store? 
So when we when we run this, so it's going to show you what it's shows. See, it's a whole bunch of stuff it showed. Right? The underscore underscore things that you see there. They are default things like which is there in the record expiry, you know, um, the digest generation, TTL, you know, time to live. But we don't, you may not want to do all that, right? So what you do if you don't want to do that is you basically go and explicitly define a schema. I want only the salary data. Okay, that's what it is trying to do. Get me only the salary data, and that's what it's going to do. When I run it, you're going to, you already see the results there. But what it'll do is it'll run, it's run, run it, and now it only gets ID name. It doesn't put all those other things in there. So now you have the ability to kind of create data and spark, put it in there again. And, and you can do this with, with Presto too. So it's not a, uh, I think Presto we may or may not support the uh, writing. But the point is you can, you know, that's relational, it's well understood. Uh, Spark is a little uh, different. So this, okay, this just works. So then there's only one other thing which is live, which I want to show you. It is a preview of what's coming in terms of indexing. Okay, and uh, oh, it's right here. I, I put all the bookmarks in the right, in the right place. So we saw the document API, we saw the Presto Trino, we saw the Spark load store. And then uh, this is a preview. So this is not out yet. It's coming in the next version. Um, it's running on my laptop, assuming it's still running. Okay, so, okay. so I'm going to set up. I'm just going to go through the setup fast. Okay. Uh, one point. Let me just go through the setup. Okay, I'm just going to do the. I'm doing the, I mean, I'm just doing the setup first. Make sure that it is running. So, so I'm just installing a bunch of stuff. Installing the client, put the modules, find the functions. Okay. okay, now I'm going to go to section 5.1. I'm doing this right. Yeah, that's what I want to show. Uh, so, okay. so, yeah, initialize the document client. Now I got to do. So now the data is loaded. Okay, well, there's a bunch of document data has been loaded, um, and I'm I'm going to index this, and I'm only going to show you the new one. Um, the space companies, right? In JSON we talked about. I'm going to go to five of three, and and essentially it loads a bunch of data in here. I'm going to look look up based on a neat, a, a deeply nested index. Okay, that's that's what I'm going to do. I know I'm going through this fast, but but it's, you know this one will be we'll put it out on the website. This is not there yet. Okay, the other things I showed you they're already out there. This has not been released yet. Uh, uh, but it will be released within the next few weeks. Um, so that basically, it's looking at a whole bunch of space companies which we got from somewhere. And somebody likes space, obviously. And then execute the query with the index. It says. So here's all the. Here's an example. Okay, how, how the, the company schema looks. You know, it's basically JSON, and there's a whole bunch of stuff, and it talks about this particular company. Uh, and now, you can find the companies by number of job posts. Right? We first create an index on the number of jobs field. You know, so you create an index, and then you you run the thing, and that's what gives you this answer. Okay? I mean, everything is dynamic with indexing, right? As you expect, you can just create an index, query it. I mean, you wouldn't do that on a petabyte scale uh, database, but you would first create the index, and then you would. You wouldn't write all of it in there. So, so you, you get all those things which have more than. But now, you want to index more deeper. Okay? Find companies by nested fields, which is the payment type. So you go deeper into the object, you know, company, you know, uh, into the payment type. And then you build an index deeper into the context, okay? It's a map key. You know, you get a value and then, and then, you know, and then go into the map key and then you get the, you, you see the nesting here, right? So you basically go down deeper into the company, and you can build an index at any level in the JSON object. That's kind of the important thing. This is not available in the in in the product that's already shipped, and it's coming. 
So this is actually the, um, and this is only, you know, uh, so I got the latest master of code here, running in a Docker container, with the Jupyter notebook and everything. Right. So that's basically created an index, you know, and, th and then it basically did the query. And that's it, actually, uh, on this one. Last thing, okay. What do I want to do here? I think there's one more thing I want to show you. Okay, time series kind. So what we have here is actually a GitHub repository with a library we wrote for time series manipulation using Aerospike. So this way you can look at it and see, you know, there's a whole uh, document here, the time series API introduction. It talks about, you know, uh, various things that you can do. Okay, and you can look at it. Um, and use it actually, it's available. Okay. And the last thing is graph, I guess. Um, and the graph is, I have to go back to this one. Because um, I already showed you uh, all of these. Okay, I, I told you the, the Spark processing thing, right? You saw the Jupyter Notebook. This is the um, code sandbox. This is the Jupyter Notebook you know, available for Spark load store on our website. Um, and this is the documentation for Presto, time series apps. You know, I already showed you this. And there's a page here that describes things. But, um, and I showed you the preview nested indexing. Right? That, that's the thing I showed you. This is basically what we're doing with Graph. I'll close with this, okay? So what are we doing with Graph? Um, we're building stuff against Tinkerbox. By building a layer underneath it, to work with Aerospike. And a lot of stuff in this layer. Like there's a translation part. We've been figuring out how to do this in performance. So one of the difficulties for Aerospike is, I kept talking about um, the work that we do in terms of SLAs and how to maintain scale. So when we add a feature, you will find that we may not support all of the features you're used to in systems which may not support the same kind of SLAs at scale. So we have to pick and choose and be very careful about how we implement these, okay? We're trying to do the same thing for graph. Um, and this is Gremlin, and eventually we probably will put that on top of this. Uh, but this is what this work is actually going on right now, um, and we have a point of view about it. Okay, uh, we think that uh, we are not again, we are not about again. I want to be very very clear. Everything I talked about here is not to say somehow we do documents so we are as good as Mongo. And no, we are not trying to compete with Mongo. We are not trying to compete with like uh, Neo4j. Okay, we are really focused on the SLAs at scale for more use cases. That's really important. Because there are a lot of, lot of applications for which Mongo is the best choice. And you should use them. And they have a huge market, they're a leader. Okay? This is not about competing. It's more about solving an SLA problem at scale. You know? and, and in order to do that, all the trade-offs I talked about, if other people are doing it, their system will be as good as ours. If they're not doing it, the system will not be as good as ours. I know this after 12 years of work on this. Our system today is much better than it was four years ago, and, and it's fairly, you know, um, even better than what it was eight years ago and 12 years ago, right? So it, it's tough you do uh, on how you bring that whole concepts in, in that, that matters. Mm -hmm. And then the point of view is, you know, there's a blog out there if you want to look at it. Uh, but really, you know, what's, the, what's with scale and databases, right? And graph databases. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, you can get that. You want to read it? It's, it's, and you can provide feedback also. And that is it. Thank you. Questions? It's mission critical because of user experience. It's, it's the same thing with, uh, because if your parcel is moving around, and I had this problem, I'm waiting for something to arrive, and then it didn't arrive. They didn't actually know. It's a customer service problem. It has nothing to do with uh, uh, what you would call uh, real time, huge load. It's more like, you know, you don't have the right knowledge of where your packets are. 
Is that acceptable for a business like FedEx? I don't think it is. Uh, do you want, don't you want to share it? That's the context in which I was saying it. It was not in the context of transactions. You're exactly right. It, it may not be that important. I want to remind everyone, we are giving away a rocket right after the Q&A. If you had a card is not in there, um, put your hand up, she'll come over, and we'll take your question. Yes? Yeah, very quick and very simple. What metrics are you using to evaluate uh, the progress in your development, right? So from version to version, what are the metrics? Is it the flow output, the speed of the application, the, the volume that you can process? Can you give a bit more about yeah. the metrics? It's actually a very good question because for a long time, as we were developing it, we were a startup, right? We were developing it. We never really did a lot of that at all. So the way we found out was, um, okay, there was one thing we were really, really careful about. One is we don't want to go back in terms of our capability for performance. This is something we really, really believe in. So that is part of the whole DNA and how we develop. But then, what happened was, and I'll be pretty honest with you, with you right? This is, this is a, it's a meetup, so I'm not going to give you any, um, um, what do you call it? Um, it'll be unvarnished. So, for a long time with our customers, we couldn't test our stuff at scale that our customers were running it. In fact, our customers weren't testing it at scale, at the scale they were running it either. But at least they had the internal knowledge of how these things run. So we recently, this, this, was a, this has been a problem for a while. So we've, we've kind of worked closely with customers to do that kind of testing. But recently, this year, we set up our own reliability and performance team, which is focused on exactly how to come up with the best practices ourselves and then let customers know. This came from a large effort that we had last year with a very large customer of ours who was having issues on running in a certain cloud. It's not about the cloud, it's not about our product, it's about running at scale in an environment which may not be, be quite different in characteristics than bare metal. So we invented a lot of circuit breakers and various other techniques that we had to do to help people come out of this uh, issues that would arise, right? So how do you characterize these things? So we set up a team, and that team has actually already made a lot of progress in characterizing some of these problems, which we couldn't characterize before. So we actually figured out how to deal with, you know, how to generate enough load with a fewer amount of resources than actually have the entire production running, right? But that's also a, a level of uh, expertise. We are developing that, so we're not, I wouldn't say we are done with that. We just started, actually. Yes? What are, according to you, what are some of the popular use cases for real-time uh, scaling? Um, just look at your phone and look at the app. I, I'm just going to give you an example from India, just because it, it's easier. And I can do the same thing from Israel or US. So if you make a phone call in India, two out of the three providers essentially are using uh, this platform. Okay, That's like 600 million people. And they're using it for a variety of things, like uh, actually making the call, maybe not, but everything closely related to it. If you're ordering groceries online, the company which delivers that is using you know, this technology. If you're um, not Amazon, but if you're shipping packets in India, that company is using it too, right? And if you're booking tickets, it's using it. Advertising is using it. So, so we are there. Um, in a lot of the things, like you know, uh, this one I can say publicly, PayPal has been using Aerospike for fraud detection because they've talked about it for years now. Right? Every PayPal transaction you do goes through some fraud detection algorithm with data which is in real time decided. So, so there is a lot of this stuff, and there's more, um, but I don't want to kind of uh, talk too much about the. the sale. It looks a little salesy, so I just. But, but we can talk more. We we do a lot of this, okay? So over the years. That's where all the learnings have come from. Before we take the, the next question, she got a great announcement. <laughs> oh yes. So you guys should have received one of these either when you walked in or on your seat. There's a QR code here. We're offering tonight, since you came to our meetup, a six month seat to Aerospike training, academy training. Yeah. So all you need to do is scan your QR code and since you came to the event tonight, you'll get a code back from us and we will offer you that six month training. 
The yeah. other thing I want to let you know is if you don't, if you didn't receive a shirt that fits for you, meet me over there at, at the end of the event and I'll get you a size that's appropriate. Thank you. Last call, put your card in after this question. We're gonna take one last question. We're gonna do the raffle and that's it. Uh, but Srini will be here for one-on-one -on -one questions yeah. after the raffle. So who wants the last question in the evening? Hands up. There's like five hands up now, everyone's embarrassed. <laughs> going once, Pink. going twice, we're going right to the raffle. Okay, we're going right to the raffle. Let's, let's awesome. The Can thing. I ask you, please, stick your hand in here, mix it all up. Mix it up good. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay, that's about good. No, don't pull one. I don't. Okay. Can I ask you just to step up here? You're going to pull a card. If you pull your own, it has happened twice in our history, so you will still win. Don't worry. The rocket is right over here for whomever is going to win it. Um, I'm going to ask you, oh my god, I was going to say look this way, but there's a mirror right here. <laughs> look that way and, and reach in and grab out a card. Okay, read it out loud. It is our email. Oh, it's me. Really? Awesome. <laughs> Wait, can you, can your name is Operational Data Analyst? No, sorry, that's in my own page. Sorry, that Yeah. Okay, congratulations, folks. It's right here for you. Oh my goodness. Questions, please feel free to come up yeah. now and ask him. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>